Praise God. Many opportunities. Many opportunities. Also, CJ wanted me to mention about fire starters. Fire starters in the morning. They're an online ministry. Ron and uh, Ron Genovetti and, and CJ are on every Thursday morning at 1030 and uh, live on online. They have different uh, people on to uh, share and minister. Plus, just it's, it's becoming a, uh, a place of revealing the different ministries. So, there's so many things that are going on in our city that we don't even know about. And so this is one way that the word gets out. People get ministered to Ron Port Poitras, Rob, Rob Poitras, what the, who used to be the mayor here in town. He's a, a county board of supervisor now. He is, was on their program this last week. And you can watch the old programs online as well if you want to, but uh, on YouTube. But anyway, they're also going to be having a Christian comedian coming on, not this week, but next week on the 20th. And they'd like to have an audience. You know, comedians like audiences. They need somebody to laugh at their jokes. So if you can make it on Tuesday morning, not this Tuesday, but the following, which is the, oh, I'm sorry, Thursday, the 20th, isn't it? Thursday the 20th at 1030. Uh, then uh, come on in and, uh, and be a part of that. Amen. Praise God. But check out their show. Check out their thing. Yeah. Yeah. Get here a little ahead of time at 10. And uh, get your popcorn and all that you, <laughs> just kidding. Now somebody's going to bring a big box of popcorn, you watch. And it'll be my fault, right? Amen. Well, let's stand this morning, amen, whatever it takes, brother. Let's stand, let's stand, let's stand. Father, we give you praise this morning. We thank you for the Holy Ghost. Thank you for the greater one that dwells in us. We thank you, Lord, that what you're doing is bigger than we can understand. It's just, uh, you, you've given us scripture a couple of years ago, the scripture out of Ephesians 3 that said it's beyond what we can even ask or think. So that's why we're here, Lord. We're here to sit at your feet, to listen to you. God, I know that I'm inadequate in and of myself to communicate the things that you need to communicate, but your spirit knows how to put his words in our mouth his thoughts in our mind. I ask for the mind of Christ to manifest in every person whose heart is open to your will for their life. And Lord, just take us uh, by your word and your spirit where you want us to go today. We're fully dependent upon you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, turn and say hi to somebody before you're seated. Praise you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hey, Glenn. Bless you, brother. Good to see you, man. Yeah. All right. All right. Hallelujah. I didn't say have a party. <laughs> Praise God. Koinonia Fellowship. Hallelujah. Pat was telling me Tuesday after Tuesday morning prayer meeting, I wasn't here on Tuesday. She said that uh, she was having trouble, they're having trouble getting everybody out of the building. That's what happens when God's in the building, huh? Amen. And you like being around people that have God in them too. I don't get people that don't go to church. I don't understand it. You know, they're looking at it from a total wrong perspective. When I come in here, I get strengthened. I get strengthened by you. I'm strengthened by your prayers, and I'm strengthened by your presence. Because Jesus is in you. Amen? Well, I'm not going to try to run off on that little rabbit trail. But uh, it is good to be with God's people and in the house of God. Grab your Bible, and we're going to try one more time like we did last week. To start in Luke chapter 4, if you weren't here last week, you, if you want to watch it online, you can on, the, on YouTube, but uh, we turned to this scripture and we never got anywhere near this scripture after that. Last week, the Lord just led us down a total different pathway about the love, talking about the love of God and walking in the love of God, 
And uh, about three quarters of the way through the message, I realized it was Communion Sunday. <laughs> I didn't have it written out on my calendar, and I just, you know, it just went right over the top of my head. And uh, then I, when I realized that, I realized, oh, well, no wonder the Lord's talking about this. He wants that when we have communion, it actually does something. How many of you know you can sit in a garage and go budden, budden, beep, beep? That doesn't mean you're a car. You can sit in a church meeting. You can even feel the presence of God. But that doesn't mean you're connecting with God. No more than getting water splashed on you from a swimming pool means you're swimming in the pool. Shandai, we're starting off big here already, aren't we? Praise God. And one of the, one of the I guess, saddest things, I guess is the way to say it. Well, let me just say this first. How many of you this last week had a lot of opportunities to get in strife? I mean, it seemed like, well, yeah, I, got, I, I have to pray and forgive the Giants every time I watch them play, it seems like. But anyway... How many of you this last week, it just seemed like more so, there was a little like more opportunity? Anybody like me? You know why? Because of what we talked about last week. See, one thing about the devil, he's faithful to his call. His call is to kill, steal, and destroy. And so he's always trying, he can't just blast in and do it, he has to deceive people into yielding to him and agreeing with him and going down his pathway, because there's two pathways in life, there's the destiny of God and there's the fate of the devil. And you choose which one you walk on. Yes. Amen. When I was 29 years old, the Lord confronted me in my work truck, told me I was at a fork in the road, and I would choose that day whether I was going to follow him and have what he had for my life, or I was going to go off on a pathway that was going to, let's just say it this way, it wasn't going to be good. And I'm glad he got in my face. It was one of those slap, you know, thanks I needed that moments. You ought to be thankful if God gives you a little spanking now and then. And, you know, not, he doesn't beat you down, condemn you. The enemy, is a, he's a child abuser. The devil is. He's, he, he, you know, he condemns you. Condemnation means uh, you're, you're wrong or you've failed or you've missed it somehow and there's no way out. But conviction that comes from the Holy Spirit may show you what you've done wrong, may expose your sin even, but then he says, here's the way out. Yes, it's called my blood. It's called repentance. It's called being honest with yourself and with me. Yes. He desires truth in the inward parts. Amen. 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 Praise God. Hallelujah. Well, have you found <laughs> Luke chapter 4? But I, this last week I had more opportunities to get in strife. And you know what? I took a couple of them. Huh? Come on. I know you're perfect and you're just floating around on glory cloud all week. And, but I took a couple of them. But you know what? I made the decision to get out of it. I repented. I asked the Lord to forgive me. And you know what? He did. Because 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sin, he's faithful, which means he'll do it every time. And just, which means... He would be an unjust God if he didn't forgive me because the blood of Jesus is paid for the price for that and he'd have to deny the cross and deny Jesus to not forgive me. Right. Next time the devil tells you you're not forgiven, slap that one on him. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Amen? He's faithful, he's just to forgive us our sins and not only just forgive us, cleanse us yeah. from anything that's not right. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Spotless garment of salvation from the Lord. Praise God. But see, that's, uh, that's just the, showing the, devil's, the devil showing his hand. The devil doesn't know everything ahead of time. He, I think he does know some things. He's a good listener. Right. Yeah. You know, he may have heard your grandma praying for you when you were three years old and the Holy Ghost showed her you were going to do this or do that later on in life, and he heard that. So he starts a plan kind of working against you to keep you from that. that that's what happened in my life and, and what I was called to do. As I look back, I can see he did that. And my grandmother knew what I was going to be. She told my dad when I was a little kid I was going to be a minister. You've got to watch them praying grandmas. They know God. It's probably why you're sitting here right now. How did I get saved? I don't know. Yeah. Uh-huh. When you get to heaven, you'll find out how. 
Praise God. But uh, the enemy is always, you know, he's working against that in our life, and he's a reactionist. Everybody say a reactionist. So he hears Pastor Purcell, who doesn't even know what he's supposed to preach on on Sunday, tries to preach out of Luke chapter 4, ends up preaching about forgiveness and love and getting over into chapter 11, 1 Corinthians, around the communion service. And while Paul told them, you guys are, when you go to church, it actually makes things worse in your life instead of better. That's what he said. He said, when you get it together, it's not for the better, it's for the worse. Because you're not walking in love. And then, we, you know, we talked about all of that last week, and the devil heard all that. He heard that, you know, oh, Lord, I'm going to walk in love. Forgive me. I, I forgive people. I'm going to release people because forgiveness is a choice, not a feeling. And I'm going to walk in love and so forth and so on. And the devil goes, is that right? <laughs> well, we're just going to give you an opportunity to not do what you said you're going to do. And he gave me some opportunities this week. And like I said, I kind of tripped over a couple of them. But one thing about tripping and falling, you can get up. The Bible says in Proverbs, a righteous person will fall seven times and rise again. And the number seven in the Bible means completion. So what he's saying there is there may be something in your life you keep tripping over. But if you'll keep getting up, there'll come a day when you don't trip over that anymore. Because you'll have the, the work of Christ in you to where you're in his image. Amen? Yes, amen. Glory to God. Well, I'm not going to charge anything for that. And don't, if, you won't, if you won't take it off my preaching time. Amen. amen? Luke 4. Jesus is entering into his earthly ministry. He's been baptized in water. The Holy Spirit came on him and empowered him to do his earthly ministry. See, Jesus didn't do his earthly ministry just because he was at one point the glorified Son of God from heaven. He came down here, he left all of that heavenly privilege in, in heaven. And he became the last Adam. He became like Adam. He had the nature of God in him. Adam had the nature of God in him before he sinned. Adam and Eve had that nature in them. Amen? Amen. But he, they, the Holy Spirit had to lead them, guide them, empower them. And the Holy Spirit had, was leading, guiding, and empowering Jesus. Led him into the wilderness to uh, fast and pray, to be with his father. The devil came. And, always, and did what he always tries to do with us when we're spending time with our Father, interrupt, right. tempt you, distract you. He did that with Jesus. He tempted Jesus in all three areas that he tempted Eve. You can read it in 1 John. You can read it in Genesis. It's here in, in Luke 4. There's three er only three areas the devil can tempt you. See, the Bible says that the devil can only tempt you with that which is common to mankind. Right. He can't tempt you with something that doesn't... Uh, pertain to mankind. And the three areas he'll tempt you in is the lust of your flesh, the, the lust of your eyes, which means the desire to have something. You know, when you see that new whatever on the shelf and you know you don't have the money to buy that. But you just got to have it. Ooh, man, I guess I shouldn't have got on that one. We've all done it. That's right, Tammy. The third one is the pride of life. What does that mean? It means you trying to be who you are without God. That's what Eve, Adam and Eve did. They made their own decisions without consulting God. God did not create you to do life without him. And if you try, you're going to fail miserably. I'm just, I love you enough to tell you that. Because I've been there, done that, went down the water slide, and got the T-shirt. Amen? And I, it's just a fact. You know, I, I want God in my life. I want to hear his voice. I don't spend time with the Lord because I'm trying to prove to him I'm Captain Holy or something. I spend time with him because I need to spend time with him. I need to walk with him in the cool of the day. I need to hear him telling me uh, what I, I need to do, what I don't need to do, what the pathway is, where I'm at. He had to tell me here not too many years back that I didn't even understand my own ministry. I'm going, great, I've been preaching for 30 years and I, didn't understand my, I don't understand my own ministry. He said, I'm not saying you've been off for 30 years. What I'm saying is where you're at now and what I want to use you for now, you don't understand that. Right. And then he explained it to me. One thing about God, he's good at explaining things. Amen? Amen? Amen. If we're listening. 
And one of the big problems in the earth, and it was a problem here in Jesus' time, is the people in Israel that he had come to bless and help and minister to and really do more than just, you know, heal their sick bodies and, and you know, uh, feed them with uh, loaves and fishes. He came to shift them over into a place in that covenant they had with God where they could have absolute total victory. See, what Moses said in Deuteronomy was still true and is still true. God wanted Israel to be an example of the goodness of God. Read the book of Deuteronomy. You'll see what God wants for your life. He says, I want to give you the days of heaven on earth. I want it to be in your life like it is in heaven. Won't it be wonderful there, having no burdens to bear? Come on. We're not supposed to bear burdens. We're supposed to cast our cares on him and let him bear the burden. Now, we bear one another's burdens. What, what does that mean? That means if I see you hurting, I come, and if there's a load on you, I help you lift that up by praying for you, ministering to you, doing whatever God tells me to do for you. But I'm not supposed to run around carrying a bunch of burdens. I'm not a donkey, in spite of some opinions of people. Amen. Come on. We're to serve. We're to have that ox spirit. Jesus had that spirit. That's right. You know, the four gospels, the first gospel, Matthew shows him as the lion, the king, Messiah, lion, ruling and reigning. The second gospel of Mark shows him as the servant, the ox, the burden bearer in the sense of in the spirit. So you don't bear, you try to bear things in the flesh, it'll just beat you down. Like walking around with a, you know, a 300 pound weight on your shoulders day after day or 24 seven. It's not going to work. After a while, it's going to beat you down. That's why you cast your cares on him. Why? Because it says he cares for you. Yes. Means he'll take care of it. Yes. And all you've got to do is walk with him and listen to him. Yes. Yes. Amen. And he'll get her done, as the old saying goes. Amen. Then the Gospel of Luke is the, the man side of Jesus, the human side. Shows him, even gives his lineage all the way back to Adam and shows that he is a, he's God in the flesh. Amen? And then the last one, the Gospel of John, shows him as that soaring prophetic eagle. That one who knew how to soar in the heavens. See, most of us spend way too much time on earth. Well, Pastor, you want me to go get a ticket at the airport in Fresno and get on a jet? No, I'm not talking about that kind. I'm talking about soaring with God. See, you don't have to stay on earth. Matter of fact, you shouldn't live on earth. You should live before the throne. Your spirit is always before the throne. Don't think in, 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 in terms of time and space. Think in terms of eternity. Eternity means no horizons, no change, no time and distance. If your grandmother has passed away 50 years ago, when you walk through the veil and step into her presence in heaven, it'll be as though it happened just a moment ago. Hallelujah. Those of you that don't think you have enough time to do things, you're going to have plenty of time in heaven. Glory to God. Wow. Praise God. So Jesus, he stepped into this earth, stepped into his ministry, came into a certain time where bad and good things were happening on earth just like it is now. God's nation was being oppressed by the Roman Empire. It wasn't the will of God for that to happen. Don't ever think that just because something happens, it's the will of God. Amen? Otherwise, he wouldn't have told us to pray, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. If everything that just happens in your life's his will, why would he have you pray a stupid prayer that wouldn't do anything? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And so there were good and bad things going on. And the, the bad part here is the people of God and even the leadership of the nation, what, they were deceived by what was going on. They were spiritually deceived and they saw themselves spiritually in light of what was happening out here. Don't let circumstance or things that are going around, on around you or somebody's opinion of you or the devil's opinion of you or your opinion of you without God's input dictate who you are, what you are, and where you are. The deceiver was holding them in bondage. 
Well, if God's really God, how come this, that, and the other? Remember Gideon? God showed, uh, the angel showed up to Gideon. Gideon's over there hiding, putting some food together for his family because he's afraid because the enemies would come in and steal everything during harvest. And the, the angel walks up and he didn't say, hey, you scared little Israelite, what are you doing over there cowering? But that's what was happening in the natural realm. Full of fear, hiding. And he said, uh, hello, mighty man of valor. I wonder if Gideon looked over his shoulder and thought there was somebody behind him. <laughs> Mighty man of valor. And Gideon, right away, what does he say? Well, if the Lord's with us, how come all this stuff's happening? Right? Read it over in Judges. I think it's Judges 6, something like that. And, uh, you know, the angel, he really didn't even address it. It already, actually, had already been addressed before even that appearance. It said the nation had stopped, stopped worshiping God and started worshiping Baal, who was, which is the devil in disguise. One of, his, uh, one of the ways you can know that Baal worships in the, in the land is they kill the children and they have sexual perversion. Hmm. Two issues that have been real big issues in our nation lately. Amen. Amen. Moving right along since that went over real big. Hallelujah. And so that angel came and put, got him on track, began to show him who he was and what God wanted to use him for. And that's what is happening right now today. You can actually tell what God's doing by watching what the devil's doing. You just take the opposite of what the devil's trying to do. What is the devil trying to do in our nation right now? He is trying to split and divide us as much as possible. And he'll find some hot button issue that may be a social problem and there may be reality and truth to even some of what's being said and there usually is. But you don't kill somebody with arsenic by walking up with a bottle that says arsenic on it, pouring some in a spoon and say, here, have some arsenic. You put it in something good. You hide it in a pie or a cake. If you try to get me, it'll be chocolate pie, chocolate cake. Anything chocolate. Hand over the chocolate and nobody will get hurt, right? But that's what the devil does. He couches, he hides in some issue. And he tells one side of the story. We've got a couple of generations of people that wouldn't know truth have walked up and kicked them in the backside. And that's just, that is the truth. I'm not picking on them saying they're idiots or something. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that my generation has not, we've allowed, the church really is, has allowed the enemy to take over in some arenas and some realms. But that, that season's over. Amen. That thing's turning around. Amen. One of the best ways to get blessed that I know is, is uh, to be willing to be wrong. If you're not willing to be wrong, you'll never get right. I'm going to say that again. If you're not willing to be wrong, you'll never get right. I've been pastoring over 30 years. When I sit down and counsel with people, talk to people about their marriages or just a, a, maybe a problem or something, the people who refuse to admit they've done any, anything wrong, those people, to my knowledge right now, most of them eventually leave the church because they, they get tired of hearing the truth. They can't take it. Or they blame me or they blame somebody else. And they've, as far as I can tell, some of them, I, I see them and get around, they have not changed one bit. They're still in the same mess, swimming around in the same demonic sewer that they were in for 15, 16 years, 20 years in some cases. You know why? They won't admit they're wrong. It's always somebody else done this to me. It's somebody else's problem. My life would be better if this, da, 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 da. Well, maybe other people have done you wrong. Maybe there are things that need to be changed. Maybe there are even social issues that need to be adjusted. But you're not going to get free by pretending that you you got to get you right. See, revival is going to happen in this nation when the church gets revived. We are the ones that lead this nation into freedom. 
You may think it's the government. You may think it's law enforcement. You may think it's army. And thank God for all of those. They all have their place. Those are all callings. There are people that are called by God to be in politics. People that are called by God to be in the army. I watch some of these young soldiers on TV. They go over and someplace they get their leg blown off from the knee down. I remember this one young man. They say, well, what, you know, what's, your, what's your future going to be? He goes, I can't wait to get back over there. Yeah. And I'm thinking, you've got to be kidding me. I mean, I just, you know why I feel that way? Because I'm not a soldier. I mean, I, I would do what I had to do to try to protect my family or my country if I had to. But that, that's a calling. There's a calling to be a police officer. There's a calling to be whatever God's called you to be. You need to find out what he's called you to be. Otherwise, you're just going to run around trying to fix your life, trying to make things happen, getting mad at everybody because they won't play your game with you, and God's just totally frustrating you on purpose because he knows it's never going to work for you until you humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, and you do what I did at 29 years old finally. You say, God, whatever you want with my life, I give it to you 110%, if that's possible, 110%. Whatever you tell me to do, even if I don't understand why you're telling me or uh, you know what that's all about whatever you tell me I'm gonna I'm gonna obey I'm gonna do whatever you tell me when you have that kind of commitment before I made that commitment I was walking around shooting my mouth off blaming my wife blaming other people making pitiful Mickey Mouse excuses look at your neighbor and say this is good I'm glad he's preaching this this morning hallelujah and I was as deceived as could be. Born again, child of God. Been saved for many years. But I was letting the devil dominate my mind because of the pride in my heart. Did you find Luke 4 yet? We're kind of in Luke 4 a little bit right now. We're there a little bit. We're talking about the, the heart attitude and the place spiritually the people were in when Jesus got to, the, to Jerusalem and to Israel. Amen. And so you know the story here. I'm not going to read all the scriptures. Many of you have read this many times, heard it preached on. Go home and read it if you haven't. He goes to his own hometown. Let's just look at verse 16. He came to Nazareth where he'd been brought up. And as his custom was, 416, Luke 416, as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. See, they knew him. He grew up there. He apparently served there and read the scripture and did this and did that. You know, and oh, he's come, you know, come back. And, and we've heard great things are happening in his ministry. We've heard about miracles and signs and wonders and all of that. There was delivered to him the book of the prophet Isaiah. When he opened the book, he found the place where it is written. And I might add, about the Messiah. And every Jew in that place knew that this scripture he was reading was, uh, was speaking prophetically about the Messiah that was to come. But they had it in their head, the Messiah was coming on a white horse, going to kick the Romans out of the land, and everybody was going to live happily ever after in Disneyland. And it was about as real as Disneyland from that perspective. Amen? And so... He read it, the Spirit of the Lord's upon me because he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted, preach deliverance to the captives, recovering of sight to the blind, and set at liberty them that are bruised. Verse 19, to proclaim, to preach, to declare the acceptable year of the Lord. Now they also knew what he was saying there was jubilee. Jubilee was every 50th year. If you got in bondage, you got, if you had, a, you know, because every family had an inheritance. The nations before Israel went into the promised land, the way kingdoms got wealthy is they attacked other people, killed their people, stole their land and their possessions, and became wealthy by enslaving the people. God says, we're not doing it that way. He says, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to give you a land. The people that have that land right now, they're, they're, Baal, they're in Baal worship. 
you go ahead and study about that. You'll see they're doing all these things. And he said, told Abraham, he says, I want you to walk. I want you to put your footprint on this land. I want you to walk up and down it because I'm giving it to you. He said, now you're going to, your, your seed are going to leave. Your people are going to leave. They're going to be gone for 400 years, but they're going to come back because I'm giving you this land and I'm giving it to them. Amen. And then he said that, and, you know, he began to reveal to them, I'm going to give an inheritance, a piece of land. Yes to each family, all of the, of the 12 tribes, and I'm going to give a piece of land to each family within that tribe, and if you will serve me and walk with me in the things that I've commanded you and, and tell you to do, then I will bless you, and you will have the days of heaven on earth in your inheritance. That was God's will, was to give you land and bless you and give you an inheritance. See, wealth is created. Wealth that is stolen is not wealth at all. It's a curse. That's right. You embrace a curse when you steal something as a thief. Yeah. Nobody gets away with every, anything, honey. That's right. Oh, they'll never know. They'll never know. Who cares if they know if he knows? Yeah. And you know what else? The devil knows. Right. And he knows he's got access through that. Boy, I could get off on the tithing right now and really make people mad. Will you, will, you, will you defend me? Will you come up? <laughs> Tithing is God's money. Tithe is, is the Lord's. Well, I don't believe in tithing. I believe it's Old Testament. No, it's not. Tithing was before the law, during the law, and if you read the book of Hebrews, you'll see it's, it's in our time now as well. Jesus is our high priest under the new covenant. We walk under the new covenant. It says, here men that die receive the tithe, there he, yes. as our high priest, receives it. Of whom it is witnessed. When you tithe, you are giving a witness. You are testifying. And to a Jew, the word testimony means you are reaching back in the past to something that was established by God, which was tithing. And you are taking a hold of that powerful truth that God said he would bless them because they did it. And you're pulling that into the future by acting in faith, testifying in that, and, the, and what that blessing that was established when it was spoken by the creative mouth of God and established forever, the blessing of that and all that is comes into your life now and begins to be produced in your life. Yeah. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yes, it is worship. Amen. It's acknowledging Jesus as who he is. It's not paying the, the bills at the church, although some of that money may go for that. I had one guy... Jesus, Lord, you're just getting me into things here, aren't you? I had one guy, he'd been in the church many years. And I could see something was hanging him up. I could see he just couldn't see. Luke chapter 6, where Jesus talks about money and the spirit of mammon, he says that people that have what he calls an evil eye, which means a greedy heart or a greedy or selfish attitude, says they're spiritually blind. And I found that to be true. Yes. Talking with Christians. Yes, sir. That when they are allowing the spirit of fear to dominate them, and they, they love money more than they do God, oh, you want to make somebody mad, just tell them that. Oh, yes. But see, I didn't say that. The Bible did. The Bible says where your treasure is, that's where your heart is. And where your heart is, that's where your treasure will be. Boy, he got on us about walking about in love last week. Now he's getting on us about this this week. But see, he's, yeah, he's not trying to get something from us. He's trying to get something to us. Right. He's trying to get the blinders off of your eyes. Yeah. He's trying to get you in a place where the enemy can't run you in a circle like a dog chasing his tail and the same demonic torment that's been in your life for years just stays there and stays there and stays there. And then like Gideon, you go, well, if you're God, what's all, where's all this stuff? I had them anoint me with oil and pray for me. I had them, you know, I mean, Pastor Big Shot prayed for me. He's got a TV ministry and a mighty anointing. The anointing has to be able to be retained when it's imparted. The Holy Ghost is a dove. You know, if you had a dove sitting on your shoulder 
And you're wanting to make sure. Isn't that what the Bible says? That the Holy Ghost came down in bodily form as a dove upon Jesus. Jesus was, I've heard Bill Johnson say it this way, hosting the presence of God. If you had a dove sitting on your shoulder, you would be very mindful of not making quick moves or yelling loud or doing something that would cause that because doves, they'll fly away just like that. Now the Holy Ghost is not, you know, he's not weak or impotent or just, you know, just going to be, you know, like a big crybaby or something. But right on the other hand, he can be grieved. Yes, sir. Yes. Amen. Yes. And when the anointing is imparted to you, you need to take care of that anointing. Yes. You need to keep the presence on you. Yes. How do you do that? You do that by walking with God. You do that by having an open heart. You do that by being honest with yourself. And if you do miss it, you repent, you admit it and quit it. What if I do it 15 times a day? Well, the Bible says, Jesus told his disciples, if you have to, you, you forgive people 144,000 times a day. So if God tells us we got to do that, he'll surely do that for us. I know, it's hard to believe that he would even do that. Have you ever been there? Oh, God, how many times have I done this, Lord, and I told you I wouldn't do it again which was a stupid thing to say to begin with. I finally quit saying that. I said, God, I'm just promising you I'm going to follow you. I'm going to walk with you. If I mess up, I'm going to admit it and quit it. I'm going to repent. I'm going to keep getting up. Hallelujah. I remember one time he told me when I was going through one of those little pity parties about that, he said, how many times did I tell you in the scripture I'd forgive you? And I'm like, well, you didn't put a limit on it. He said, then why are you even talking to me about this? He just thinks different than we do. Amen. But we have to be willing to be honest with ourselves. I'm not, I'm not after your money. I don't want your money. I want his money. Because when I get his money from him, it's got a blessing on it. If I get your money with a wrong heart, it's got a curse on it. Don't put your curse on me. That's why I tell people, you know, if, if you can't give with a free heart and understand that you, you're to be a blessing, don't give. You're going to need every dime you've got. We're even told by Paul, we're not to give under compulsion. When some preacher stands up and starts pressuring you for money, you need to say, I'm not giving to you. Unless God tells me to, I'm not going to do it. Because you're compelling me to give. The Holy Ghost will pay his bills. Where God guides, he provides. And if he's not providing, maybe you're trying to do something he didn't tell you to do. Man, I'm talking about a bunch of stuff I didn't even... Come on. Praise God. God got right after me about money when I committed my life to him fully in 79. He started challenging me in that. I mean, he was after me. <laughs> and I'm like, why? After a while, I go, God, what are you putting so much pressure on me about this for? What are you challenging me for? I remember one time I was laying on the couch. We were living in Clovis. I was laying on the couch watching TV on a Saturday. Jimmy Swaggart, I think it was, was on TV and I was watching him. And he was putting a radio station in Israel, I believe, if I remember correctly. And was it Mexico? Uh, that must have been somebody else another time. Thank God for a good wife. has got a better memory than you do. Amen. And so I'm, you know, laying there and I'm just watching this. And I have no intention of uh, participating in that. And I heard the Holy Ghost saying to me, I want you to give him a thousand bucks. It scared me so bad, I jumped up off the couch and tried to hide behind it. I'm serious. Before I even know what I'd done, I got off the couch and I'm down behind the couch looking over the top of it at the TV. That was my reaction. I rebuke you, devil. No, I'm... But anyway, I went through a process. Not just that one instance, but other instances. And finally, I'm going, Lord, why are you after me about this so much? He says, because I've got to get you free from the fear 
of paying the bills, fear of finance, fear of money, because otherwise you'll attach yourself to money and you'll worship mammon and you'll be spiritually blind and you will not even be able to see what I need for you to see in your life. That's all in Matthew 6. You can read it. Hallelujah. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but if he's been dealing with you about this, you need to obey him. It's going to set you free. Now, Jesus here, we're, we're preaching out of Luke 4 one way or another today. Verse 19, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. That was a jubilee, and I just mentioned, every 50 years in the natural realm in Israel, if you'd messed up and you'd lost your inheritance, maybe you made some bad business deals and you had to lease your inheritance out to somebody, they had no right to take your inheritance from you. You, had, you, you could lease it to them. And maybe, you know, it's such a bad situation, you have to go to work for the guy that has your land now and work for him for wages in order to help pay this off. Or, you know, you could even be an indentured servant away from your land for someone else or whatever kind of a mess you've gotten yourself into. Every 50 years, they blew a trumpet. Da, 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 da! And they proclaimed freedom, liberty. That's what Jubilee means. Liberty. Did you know that the scripture in the Old Testament in Leviticus that talks about Jubilee is written on the Liberty Bell in Philadelphia? Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. The Holy Ghost intended for this land to be a place of freedom for everybody. Yes. 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 Amen? Yeah. And so then they would, they could, the three things could happen when the year of, of Jubilee came. They would go, they would be free from bondage. If they were an indentured servant, they could say, see you later. You may have worked for the guy for 48 years or five years or one year. But it's Jubilee, later days, dude, I'm out of here. I'm free. I'm free. God has set me free. No bondage. No bondage. No bondage. No more bondage. No more bondage. No more bondage. Just glorious victory. Number two, you could go home. You were to go home and connect with your heritage. Your family. Yes. Your family heritage. Yes. How many of you love to read all the begats in the Old Testament? Yes. So and so begat the, you know, you made that commitment, I'm going to read the Bible all the way through. And then you get to the begats and you're like, so and so begat, so and so. I can't even pronounce the nine tenths of these. You know why that was important to the Jews? Because it, their heritage, their inheritance, their life, their place in the nation depended on who they were related to. Amen? And so they were to go back and reconnect with their family. Reconnect because the blessing, now listen to this. This is important for you and me. The blessing on their life, those days of heaven on earth that Moses talked about, could only happen for them on their property with their people. Now, that's, that's a, a kind of a, a hidden spiritual truth. Hopefully, we'll get back to that in just a second. The third thing was God then began to restore to them the fullness of their inheritance. They got set free from slavery and bondage. They went back and reconnected with their heritage, their family, their people, and God restored to them their land or their inheritance. And then he blessed as they walked with him. Amen. They blessed that piece of land. He blessed that inheritance. He blessed those people and caused them to flourish. Amen. Glory to God. So here's Jesus coming on the scene, reading Messianic scriptures of the one who would come to bring Jubilee to the nation, and they knew that, but they thought it was going to happen through warfare, and he's saying, no, 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 no. It's not going to happen the way you think it's going to happen. See, that's a lot of the problem with us. We think it's going to happen this way, and it happens that way. That's why we can't be Holy Ghost Junior. You're not going to figure it out sometimes. Just, it's good enough just to know it's going to happen. And just listen every day. And, you know, I find myself, well, what am I doing over here in this place with these people doing this? The Holy Spirit's leading you down a customized pathway to what he has for you. He's connecting you rightly. Amen? So 
He began to proclaim this. Now, verse 20, he closed the book, gave it to the minister, and sat down. Now, the place he sat down was in a chair that they had in every synagogue that remained empty because they were expecting Malachi to happen. They're even expecting it today for, Mal for Elijah to show up. The, you know, the coming of Elijah. And Elijah did show up. He showed up in John the Baptist. The spirit of Elijah was upon John the Baptist to prepare the people for the coming of the Lord, who is right here. He's come. And that first time he came. He sat down in the Messiah's chair. Now, you talk about upsetting some religious folks. Wait a minute. And they went on and, and even accused him of this. You're Joseph's kid. What are you doing? You're not the Messiah. Who do you think you are anyway? Right. Quoting these messianic scriptures and saying that we're in a day, a season, a, a kairos moment, a, a spiritual time where God will do this. Amen. Yeah, he knew who he was. Amen. And he knew who they were, too. They didn't know who they were. Yeah. Verse 21, he began to say to them, he began to say. You know, when God starts talking, shut up and listen. Yeah. I'm saying that as kindly as I know how. Yeah. I don't have a whole lot of time today. Amen. Yeah. Listen. Let him finish. Let him talk till he's done. Yeah. We're kind of like a little kid, you know, that your parents are going to take you to Disneyland in six months. Guess what, son? We're going to Disneyland. I'd run off and tell all the neighbor kids, we're leaving tomorrow for Disneyland. No, you're not. You're not leaving for six months. You didn't listen long enough. And then when you come back and say, Mom, when are we leaving tomorrow? We're not leaving tomorrow. We're leaving in six months. What? We need to listen and keep listening. Amen? This day, this scripture is fulfilled in your ears. He was getting ready to explain to them about what he just said. But they didn't let him do that. All bear him witness, wondered at the gracious words that proceeded out of his mouth. Notice they didn't receive the gracious words. They wondered about him. I wonder what he's talking about. What in the world is he? he man, he's on some kind of trip. He thinks he's the Messiah. We may need to call the white coat guys for him. Come on, are you here? They wondered at the gracious words. See, God's a God of grace. And you know what he's going to say to you? Words of grace. Amen? Yeah. Even when he tells you, you are wrong and you need to repent, that is a word of grace. Because he's giving you a way of escape from the enemy's curse in your life. And when he comes to you and you feel like 10 miles of bad road and you're ready to quit and you're beating yourself up and, you know, after you beat on yourself for a while, you let the devil beat on you for a while. And God comes to you and says, son, nothing's changed between me and you. I know you're a human. I don't fall off my throne because your humanity shows up now and then. See, it's quiet in here right now because some of you don't even believe that. You know, one thing about us, we have a tendency to get on, instead of staying in the middle of the road, get on one side or the other. One side is greasy grace. You don't ever have to repent of your sin. You just live. Jesus did it all for you, so you don't have to do nothing. That's nonsense. The other side is, we've got to be perfect or God's not going to accept it. That's nonsense, too. The middle of the road is a heart toward God of honesty, openness, and purity. And God loves us, and he's going to tell us when we're wrong so we don't fall in one side of the ditch. We get back over here. And at the same time, he's not going to beat us up because we slip and we fall. He's going to heal our hurt. He's going to help us. He's going to encourage us. He's going to show us what to do to get back in that place of fellowship and move forward with him. Amen. Amen. Onward, Christian soldiers. Amen. Praise God. So, you know, they started judging him and, you know, doubting him and saying things. And he basically put it right back in their lap. He said, in the spiritual season when Elijah was in the earth, there were many widows dying in the famine that was on the land for three and a half years. But only one of them could God take Elijah to and get food to her throughout that famine. Why? Because she accepted Elijah for who he was. The prophet of God. When you give somebody, you got a kid, and you and that kid are starving to death, you got one last meal, 
you're gathering a few sticks to cook it so, and eat it, and some preacher shows up and says, give me a little bit of it first. Make me a little cake first. You're a God truster if you give that guy some food. Right. Amen? Amen? But he said many of them died. Covenant women, that they died because they didn't know what season they were in. They didn't know who the man of God was. They didn't know what this was about. And then he says many lepers were here in Elisha's time of ministry as the prophet over the nation. But many of those covenant lepers went ahead and went the whole thing with leprosy and died of leprosy. But yet one guy who was an enemy of Israel over in Syria, a general in the army of Syria who invaded Israel time and time again, and he took a little slave girl captive, took a little Israelite girl captive as a slave, had her in his house, and she saw that he had leprosy. She said, too bad you're not back over in Israel. There's a prophet over there that's got a healing mantle on his life, an anointing and a blessing on his life, and he would recover you of the leprosy. Amen. And all the lepers in Israel died. Covenant men. But one enemy of God who was full of pride and anger finally humbled his heart under the words of the Lord, went and did what God told him to do, dipped seven times in the Jordan River, and he was healed. See, what was Jesus doing? He said, don't put it on me, it's on you. Oh, we don't like hearing that kind of preaching. Because, see, a lot of people shift into condemnation at that point. That's not what he's saying. Right. He's saying figure out what time you're in, what season you're in, and what, who God's using and how he wants to use them and what he's doing. Yes. That's all you've got to do yep. is go with the flow. Amen. How is God flowing? I heard one preacher years ago say this. He, said, he says one of the secrets to being blessed is finding out what God's doing and go do it with him. God's not sitting up on his throne twiddling his thumbs, saying, twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I wonder what you are. He is very, very active. He's seated on his throne of, of victory and glory, but he has spoken. Read Hebrews 3 and 4. He, when he created this world and created man, he released into time his eternal word. And over the ages and eons of time, it says in Hebrews 11.3, there's a, a, been an unfolding and a rolling forth and a going forth of God's will, plan, and purpose. And he's waiting for you and I to put up our Holy Ghost antenna and pick up on what he's saying to us about our part in that, in our day, in our season, and connect with that and go with it. And we, don't have to, we won't have to run around and try to get out of stuff all the time. God will take us into something and we'll be blessed. And when the devil does attack us, he'll end up being pushed to the side and you'll go on. Amen. Amen. Some people want to get healed so they can sin without pain. Now if you ask them that, they're going to say no, 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 no. The next question is, well, uh, are you truly, sincerely, have you gone to God and said, God, here I am, here's my life, lock, stock, and barrel. That's another old saying that some of us might not know. I'm yours. What do you want with me? Amen. What do you want me to do? Yes, sir. I knew as a, a teenager I was called to preach. At 29 years old, I asked him that question. You know what he told me? He said, go to this church, serve this pastor, and, and minister or serve the people in any way you can. He didn't say, oh, well, you're called to preach. Here's a mic. <laughs> Go preach. Right. Now, we are to preach. We are to witness. We are to, you know, the Bible tells us we have opportunity to witness and all that. But there's a process of God taking us into the fullness of what he has for us. And every one of you have a call on your life. If you live your life backwards, how do I do that? You try to be who you think you are. And you go and you try to do that instead of letting God tell you who you are and living in what he says. You'll be like somebody walking like this all the time. You're going to bump into some things, trip over some things. Maybe walk off a cliff. Maybe step out in front of a Mack truck. Do they even have Mack trucks anymore? Do they? Okay. Come on, are you here? But as I follow, and man, the Lord just keeps bringing this up. He's brought this up to me several times this week. We need to hear this. 
The devil, see, the devil's a deceiver. He wants you to run around and try to fix your life. You're so busy fixing your life, you don't have time to help somebody else get theirs fixed. But your life gets fixed when you help other people get fixed. When you give tithe, you know, like we're talking about money, when you give tithe and offering, and that money goes for the gospel to go forth, not only here in Madeira, but like Karen said, over in Thailand, to, you know, to other people and other ministries. I think we, we support somewhere around 20 different 17 different ministries that we give into. 10% of all the general fund offerings in this church go into missions. And so as we divide that up and give it into those ministries, then you are going forth in that money. You are going forth in that tithe. And you are helping to reach those people. You're supporting those men and women of God that are doing that active work of the ministry. You've helped evangelize northern Thailand. Because of Charlie Milbrod, who will be here later on this this month. He's, a, he's been up there. He's got an orphanage. He's got a school. He's establishing churches. He's affected the whole nation of northern Thailand. They know who he is over there. And you're going to get a reward for it. Jesus at the Bema seat, the judgment seat of Christ, is going to call you up and say, I'm, I want you to have this jewel in your crown or this blessing or whatever, you know, a uh, $20 thing to Starbucks or something. I don't know what it would be. No, I'm just kidding. Just kidding. I got to get your attention somehow. Talk about Starbucks. That wakes everybody up. He says, I'm going to reward you for what you did in Thailand. I've never been to Thailand. Oh, yeah. In your finance, in your giving, in your heart, you went there. And when you, when you gave that money... Jesus, as high priest, received it. Read Psalm 133. The high priest receives that. And then the life of God, come on, the life of God and the anointing of God, it says over there, flows down from him, not only to you, but out through what you do and blesses people. Amen. Hallelujah. Isn't that good? Yes. That is good, 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 good. Better than good. Hallelujah. And so Jesus was telling them, you don't understand, or he was telling them, he was proclaiming to them, the acceptable year of the Lord. This is Jubilee. This is the year of liberty. And then he walked around the earth for three and a half years handing out liberty to those that would receive. First step what? You've got to recognize you're in bondage. You need to, if you haven't already, pray and say, Lord, I want to be delivered from everything that's holding me in bondage. Yes. You will be surprised yes. if you really mean that and you pray that and then you spend time with Jesus worshiping him, letting him talk to you, letting him show you scripture. You will be surprised areas that you're deceived and the enemy is holding you in bondage that you didn't even know. Some things are obvious. If you're addicted to drugs and they're slowly killing you, it's obvious that's bondage. But there are other things like thought patterns, belief systems, even self-curses. Come on. Things that God, you know, my, my son Mike, when they, he, they uh, diagnosed him with leukemia, the, the next Sunday he called me on the phone. He said, Dad, God's telling me to stay home this morning on Sunday and meet with him. I said, stay home and meet with him. And he did. And the Lord confronted him about what he'd been saying about himself since he was a child. He started saying when he was a teenager primarily, I'm never going to live past 30 anyway. I'm never going to live past 30 anyway. I said, where'd you get that idea? He goes, I don't know. I just started saying, I don't know where he got it. Some stupid devil told him that and he started saying it. Come on. How many of you know who Elvis Presley is? Thank you very much. Not too bad, huh? Can't sing like him, but talk like him. Wise men say. <laughs> yeah. Elvis Presley used to say, he's got, he had Christians around him all the time. As a matter of fact, an assembly God pastor that he counseled with said, I know Elvis was saved. I know he'd received Christ. But he had this bondage in his life. You can be a Christian and still be in bondage in areas. Amen? 
But they said he used to say all the time, I'm never going to outlive my mother. His mother died at the exact same age he died. You've got to watch that stuff. Amen? The devil started attacking me back around 2000, telling me I was going to die young, and it was an attack, buddy. It wasn't just a suggestion. One day I said, God, what do you say about that? You know, it's always good to ask God his opinion. And just that quick, I heard the Holy Ghost in me say in my thoughts, with long life, I will satisfy you and show you my salvation. Yes. Psalm 91. That's what he says about it. What do you say about it? Death and life is in the power of the tongue, the Bible says, and they that embrace it or love it will eat the fruit thereof. You will produce the fruit of what you're believing and saying out of your mouth. Jesus said that. Proverbs says that. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. Boy, we're covering a lot of different things today, aren't we? I've got to quit. Is it too hot in here? No? Okay. It's kind of warm for me. Hallelujah. So, so three things. Let me just end it with this. Three things. Number one, you are either being set free this is the first thing that's going to happen. See, if you're a bond, if you're a, a servant, if you're a slave and someone you're working for them, and you're still in the bondage, you're not going to be able to go home and reconnect with your heritage. You've got to get free from this first before you can go to that. Amen. So the Lord's going to come. Jesus explained it this way. He said, I'm the trunk, I'm the vine, you're the branch. And he says... Basically, the bottom line on that whole thing, that parable he was telling, he said, the branch can't do anything without being connected to the trunk. You cannot produce, you can do nothing without me, he said. So we look to the Lord, and if there are places we've connected ourselves, or the enemy's deceived us into connecting ourselves, he's going to disconnect us, or he's going to take that branch, our life, and he's going to prune things off of it that don't belong on it. You know, I saw something about holiness this last week that I'd never seen in my life. Do I have time to share? Just real quick. We're, we're coming in for a landing here, folks. But if you've ever been in a plane, it takes about a half hour once they start backing the engine. <laughs> Amen? I got excuses for all of it, man. I won't try to go into all the, the details. I'll just put it out there. Holiness is always, has been always taught in the church about a, a way we live, the way we act, how we think. And, you know, we are to be holy. We are to do good works. We are to try to imitate God and, and be like God. But the problem with trying to be like God is you can't. You have to be him. Now, wait, don't, don't start throwing rocks yet. You have to absorb. Here's the way he showed it to me. And I don't have time to even show you the scriptures. But he said, John, the only way something's going to leave your life, because we're still talking about getting rid of bondage. Because okay. if, if I've got some kind of bondage in my life that's hanging me up, a way of thinking, a drug habit, um, hatred, you just name it, whatever it is. The only way I'm going to get rid of that is if he cuts it off. Right. And the way it leaves is by me getting in his presence. There's only one thing in his presence, and that's fullness of joy. Amen. Fullness of joy. Amen. And the joy is our strength. And what he was showing me is, is if you will just come to me and worship me and be with me, magnify me, spend time with me, let me uh, connect with you as one spirit. He said, Think, I will make a change inside of you to where just like in the fall when a chemical change takes place inside a tree, the leaves that you can't even pull off sometimes in the summertime, you got to get a sharp instrument to cut them off. Those leaves just fall off. Those things fall. In other words, you become more like him when you're with him. The Bible says in the New Testament, as we look into the face of Jesus we are changed into that image. 
Now, see, we, we always look at it and or think about it as, oh, I've got to do better in this area. I've got to quit doing this. I've got to start doing this. I've got to, you know, I've got to, I've got to, I've got to, I've got to. Well, if you could have, could have, could have, you would have. But being with him. Yes. Remember when they, they saw the, Jesus coming out of the disciples? What did they say? Ah, you've been with him. Yes. I take note, these guys have been with Jesus. How did they know that? Because the way Jesus was acting is the way they were acting. Right. What was happening in him was happening in them. Amen. So see, the devil wants you to get so busy trying to be a good person and trying to do a ministry. and try, He wants you to substitute Action or works for presence and fellowship. Amen. Jesus, Mary and Martha. Jesus didn't rebuke Martha because she was wanting to serve and do. He rebuked her because she was doing it at the wrong time. I mean, he, he didn't really rebuke her. He just corrected her. She's all in the flesh. You know, people that are trying to do something good and you won't join them in the flesh. In the flesh. They get mad at you. Jesus looks at Martha and says, Martha, your sister has chosen that good part that will not be taken from her. There's a time to go do, Martha. But there's a time to sit at my feet and absorb something from me that the devil can't take away from you. You'll become like me. And if you study the, their life, you find that later on when their brother died, it wasn't Martha he can, was able to connect with to raise Lazarus. It was Mary. Mary was hurting just like Martha. Martha was hurting just like Mary. But Martha, when she heard Jesus was coming, she didn't stop and say, Father, should I go talk to him? You have to have a relationship to do that. She just, okay, it's about time. I've been waiting for that jive turkey for three days. <laughs> you know she was upset because of what she said. If you'd been here, my brother wouldn't have died. But, I'm going to let you off the hook. Because I know that whatever your father tells you will happen anyway. And he said, Martha, don't you know that if you'll just believe, you'll see the glory of God? Your brother will rise again. Oh, yeah, I know he's going to rise again in the future one day when the resurrection happens. See, I wonder if back at that time when Mary was sitting at his feet, if he said something that would have made her understand what she should have done right then. And I think that's true many times. He's preparing us for what we're going to face so we know. And we get that at his feet, being with him. And then he called for Mary. Mary didn't jump up and run just because he was there. She knew, I need to listen to him. I need to listen for God's voice. And so Martha comes and says, he's calling for you. And so she goes over there and she fell at his feet. Notice the position she took. She fell at his feet, and she said, if you'd been here, my brother wouldn't have died. She was hurting too, but she was in the right spot. And then when that happened, Jesus began to be moved with compassion, and he began to weep, not because he was sad and sorry or Martha hurt my feelings and I'm going to go have a pity party and cry. Nope. God, the, the compassion of God. There was a connection with him and, and Mary. There was a connection that caused the compassion of God. The Bible says Jesus was moved with compassion and healed the sick. Yes. Yes. And he raised Lazarus. Yes. Hallelujah. You see, God wants us to come and be with him. You can't substitute action for presence. Your actions need to come out of the presence. Your ministry needs to come out of your time with him. Otherwise, you'll run out of gas right. if you're not being with him, getting your batteries recharged. Amen? So we're in a year of Jubilee. We're in a time right now where he's saying, I want to set you free. Come and be with me, and I'll set you free. And it might not happen a week from Tuesday. It may take six months to get you free in some areas because he's going he's to peel off the things like peeling an onion. Yeah. If he tried to deal with all of it at one time, it would be so traumatic for you, you'd probably die. He's going to peel off the, the bondages, some of them that you don't even know you have. Right. Right. Then secondly, he's, he's going to say, okay, now, connect with your heritage. That's some of what the Holy Ghost was saying through Tim this morning. The devil's trying to divide us by race, 
by income levels, any kind of thing he can come up with, he's trying to divide us right now. Now I know, now listen, I know that everything isn't in balance in those areas and things do need to be corrected. I'm well aware of that. I'm not saying stick your head in the sand and ignore it. But I'm also saying you're not going to cure it through strife. You're going to make it worse. And you're going to make it worse on you. Because the Bible says in James where strife is, there's every evil work. So what do I do? If I feel I've been wronged by somebody, I forgive them. I pray for them. I bless them. Jesus said, bless your enemies. Not just the people you like and you think like you. Bless them. Pray for them. You get Jesus moving in this nation, he's going to cure all the ills. He's going to bring things into balance. Not only that, he's going to bring a glory on this nation that you and I have never experienced. But part of that, you know, is me being who I am and the tribe I'm from in the body. I have a natural lineage. I have a spiritual lineage. My spiritual lineage is in Hebrews 11. It's the same family you're from, spiritually. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Cultures. We all ought to celebrate our culture. Amen, our natural culture. You should enjoy your culture. You should enjoy your history. You should, you should be proud of the fact that you're, you're a part of God's rainbow people in the, in the... And I'm not talking about the rainbow people. We pray for them. Because God, God's going to move mightily among that group too. You just watch what I'm saying. Aren't you glad God's not just into gray? He's made us all different kinds of people, different personalities, different colors. And we need to celebrate that. I, I should celebrate that. You should connect with that. But don't make it something that divides you against the other people because a house divided won't stand. That's why my Christian heritage is number one. The Bible says that all people were made of one blood. I'm not concerned about what color a person's skin is or what heritage they are naturally. I'm concerned about what blood is in their life. Is it the blood of Jesus? They're a, a, a human being. They have the same blood I've got. We've got to put all that aside and start forgiving one another and loving one another and blessing one another. And I'm telling you right now, you just watch. Stuff that people have fought and wrestled and dis- demonstrated about and even, you know, done destructive things about, those things will start getting cured in our nation because the church takes its position of being revived into the unity of love and we begin to do these things. We begin to show people we don't have to do this through some kind of war or civil war. We can do it by blessing and praying and coming together. And yeah, you got this opinion and I got this opinion, but let's just give all of our opinions to God and let him start talking to all of us and let's do what he tells us to do and watch it come out right. Amen. Now, that doesn't mean that you can't, you know, be politically active or you can't address an issue you think's wrong, but there's a way to address an issue without turning it into division. That's about as political as I'm going to get today right there. You're going to get free when you start forgiving. Things are going to change in your family when you start forgiving and blessing. You're going to, you reap what you sow. If you bless, you're going to get blessing back. So there's this reconnection with our heritage in the right way that God's going to do. He's going to reconnect the church. See, the church has been divided. We've allowed denominationalism to become divisive. I'm not against denominationalism. If somebody, you know, they believe things a certain way, as long as they're not changing the foundational truths of the word, I'm not against them believing something a little different than me. But if they make, if, if they start saying, I'm not a Christian, and I start saying, they're not a Christian, or I start saying, stay away from those people, blah, 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 then I'm, I'm committing some kind of Christian dissection on the body of Christ that I don't have the right to commit. I'm dividing. Amen? So we pray and we bless. 
I'll tell you one thing I found is a great thing is I ask God, who is that pastor there? Who is that church? Why are they in this city? Yeah. He'll tell you. Yeah. He'll show you. He'll show you why he put them there and what the mission is for them. And so now you can get behind that and pray for that. And then the last thing out of that is the fullness of inheritance. The fullness of destiny comes when we allow him to start setting us free. We move, begin to move in that liberty and that freedom. We reconnect with our heritage. See, a lot of people today are going, oh, nationalism is bad. We shouldn't, you know, shouldn't be United States of America. United States. We're not saying we're better than anybody else in the world. But I can tell you this, if we're not united, we're not going to be anything but like a bunch of other people in the world that are running around shooting at each other. Amen? Amen. It's not about Democrat, Republican, this or that. It's about you and I coming into that place of covenant together and celebrating one another, celebrating what God's doing, celebrating the melting pot, celebrating all these things as one nation under God. And as we do that, then out of that is going to come the blessing and the goodness of God. It's true. It's true. Father, I praise you today. You know, I had the sense this morning when we first started this service that there were people here today in this service that were key, what I'd call key people. Now, I'm not talking about natural. I'm not talking about me looking out and saying, oh, so-and-so's here and that person's here. Or that. I, I wasn't, it wasn't that way. But I believe it was a revelation from the Holy Spirit saying there are people here today that are key people. You know, there are people that God uses like a key to open a door so that others can go through. And there are people here today that God is wa wanting to use you in some of the things we've talked about today to open up a door for people that maybe people from your race, maybe people from your denomination, maybe people you know, from the background that you had before you knew Jesus, whatever it is, there's a, you're a key. You, you're like the key of David. God is using you to open up a door in the spirit. And I'm not saying you're going to go and start talking to those groups of people. You may or you may not. You may never do any of that. You may just stand up and say, I open that door in Jesus' name, and I choose to pray for that, and I'm going to stand for that and be that that God's called me to be, and open up a spiritual door and things start happening. See, if things don't change in the spirit, they never change in the natural. They just get worse. And if you have ears to hear what I've been talking about today, and it has spoken to your heart, then I would say you're one of those keys. So just open your heart to the Lord this week. Just open your heart to him and say, Jesus, show me how to be the key of David in your hand. Your word says in Revelation that you have the key of David. And then when you open, no man can shut it. And when you shut it, no man will open it. And so, Lord, I thank you for these that are here today. I know that they're pioneers in their hearts. I know that they're the kind of people that aren't afraid to break some new ground, not afraid to go into a place that maybe they've never been before or a place, God, that their heart keeps yearning to step into that destiny that you have for, him, for them. And maybe they look around and they, they don't see anybody else doing that or anybody else that's uh, uh, brave enough or uh, they, that's you know, a person that's being dominated by fear and won't do that. But Lord, I pray in Jesus' name that your people today, as we sang this morning prophetically, history makers, I pray, God, that this group of people that's listening to me right now in this building and on the Internet, I pray that they will be history makers, that they will reverse the curse, 
that's on this nation, been on this nation, and that they will begin to lead generations into freedom, Father, the freedom that you have. The enemy's been working hard to keep our nation from its destiny, but it hasn't worked, and you have revealed to us that you are pouring out your mercies, that you have through the atonement of Jesus Christ and his blood and what his blood is speaking to us about. You have made available your healing mercies, the mercy to reverse the curse and to lead us as a people into a new place. God, I thank you that you help us as a nation, as people, all tongues and tribes. Lord, bring us into that spiritual unity to where we become an example of the unity that's there in heaven, Father. That unity of heaven, God. Let it come down on earth through the people that are under the sound of my voice right now. And Lord, I pray that you'll reveal this to us, that you'll talk to us about this, that you'll show us, Father, how we can follow you into this and see you do this through our lives. Because it's a spirit of freedom and liberty. And many will be set free because of it. In Jesus' name. You know, when you get over in the spirit, the anointing comes on you, you just start seeing things that you don't see when you're not there. And I'm telling you, I can't explain it to you. I don't even fully understand it myself. But I'm telling you what God's about to do is so big. He's actually, he isn't a, he's doing it now. But we're in that, that, the, you know, that... Small things don't despise the days of small things. We're in that just beginning time. The water's just starting to flow. Things are just starting to grow. Things are just starting to happen. But as we stay with God and we don't allow the devil to dissuade us or distract us, but we are sincere before him and we listen to him and we let him take us forward, we're going to be a part of the tremendous great move of God. You don't have to be like the Pharisees and miss God when he's standing in front of you on two legs, you can have the favor of the Lord, the favorable year of the Lord. So, Father, we thank you for it. Many of these people have stood for years. I've watched them go through hell and high water. I've watched them stand against a demonic attack against their bodies, against their minds, against their families, their children. And Father, I thank you that your word says the faithful person will abound in the blessings of God. They've been through the test. They've been through the trial. They've been through the fire. They've been through the demonic assaults. And now, Lord, it's time for this thing to turn around. I thank you that prophetess Cindy Jacobs, that Lord, this last week, you gave her the Spanish word for enough. That you proclaimed and said, it's enough. And now the tables have turned. Now things are beginning to flow in the right direction. Now the harvest comes. Now the blessing comes. Now the, re the reversal of the curse comes and manifests in Jesus' name. And God, I thank you for that. I rejoice in that. It's you that's doing it. But Father, you've called us to walk with you, to continue, Father, to use the sword of the Spirit, which is the, the speakings of God through our mouth, and to stand in that place, Father, that we might have the fullness of what you've called us to as a people, as a family, as a nation, as a world. We thank you for it, Father. Hallelujah. Arise and shine, my friends, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. Darkness will cover the earth, and gross darkness the people but the Lord shall arise upon you. So they don't have to live in darkness. Like it was said about Jesus. They that sat in darkness saw a great light. The Lord will arise upon you and his glory will be seen upon you. It's time for you to arise in these things that he's showing you. Take them to heart. Live in them. Be intentional. Spend time with the Lord. Talk to him. Let him talk to you. Move out into the fullness of what he has for you. There's an anointing right now from heaven for you to receive revelation you've never had before. 
God is unveiling mysteries, things that have been a mystery to you and I. He's unveiling them in this day. That thing about holiness that he showed me, I don't know if I did a very good job of explaining it or not, but I see holiness in a light and in a way that I've never seen it before, and it's such a wonderful thing that he showed me, such a freeing thing for me that he showed me about it. And it's available to you right now. We just celebrated the 4th of July, our day of freedom, our declaration of freedom. And I declare freedom over you in your life today in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Stand with me. Praise God. And praise Him. Thank Him for the freedom. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. He's in you. You carry the Spirit of God in you. Declare your freedom today. Declare your jubilee today. Thank Him for your jubilee. Thank Him for your freedom. I'm free, hallelujah. Whom the Son has set free is free indeed. I'll not put up with the enemy and his bondage and his lies. I will not put up with anything but what God Almighty has said to me and about me. I decree my freedom today in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. I'm connecting with my heritage. I'm going to have my inheritance, the fullness all the things that my family may have lost that belong to us, all those spiritual heritage that need to be passed down to me and, and inheritances, I receive them in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. For the glory of God that I might finish my course on this earth. Glory to God. Hallelujah. And I say the same over you today in Jesus' name. Oh, Lord, let it dawn on us. Let it dawn on us. Give us dreams and visions if need be. Give us angelic appearances or uh, whatever needs to happen, Father. Like Karen was talking about this morning when Cornelius stepped into a heritage that he didn't even know he had. Ha right. <laughs> ha. Oh, he went through a door for us. He was the key. And we're saved as Gentiles today because of what happened in that day. Let it happen again, Lord. In Jesus' name, hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. Well, we're going to go ahead and just let you go, but let's pray real quickly over some needs here. And if you need prayer for anything, feel free to come up and we'll agree with you in prayer. But I just feel to let you go. By the way, Brother Ron Jonavetti is going to preach for us tonight, minister tonight. So come back and hear what Brother Ron's got to say. It's going to be good. Amen. So we want to pray right here for a lady that was diagnosed with cirrhosis of the liver. One of her kidneys has failed and the other is having trouble. We want to pray for her. And then we want to pray also uh, for someone who graduated from the police academy and they want a job in a small town like Madeira or Chowchilla. So let's, uh, let's agree with them. Amen? And if you know somebody right now, they come to your mind, just bring them up before the Lord. We'll come together before him. Father, we agree for these needs right now. We speak into the state of Texas where this woman is with this physical problem. We speak into her body right now. And we release the healing virtue and power of God. God, I thank you that angels are dispatched to minister to her. I thank you that the body of Christ is activated in their gifts and anointings for her. God, we believe for a divine intervention in Jesus' name. And we come against that imbalance and that disease in her body. God, give her a new liver. Give her a new liver, however you have to, Father, however you need to. We ask you to activate her kidneys, Father. Activate her kidneys. Fix that kidney problem, Father, in Jesus' name. And, Lord, we agree for this one who's uh, uh, made this commitment to be a, a police officer. Lord, your word says that that's a ministry. And I ask you to bless that minister of the Lord. God, you have a place for them to be. You know where they need to be, what police force they need to be on. And so we agree for that door to open for them. We thank you for protecting them and their fellow officers and that you use them for your glory, Father. In Jesus' name. And we agree as well for any other need that was prayed for this morning. We come into agreement. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, God bless you. Have a great afternoon. We'll be back tonight at 6.